Good morning, dear colleagues. Thanks for the introduction. Um, and it's an honor for me to talk about when and how to treat endoscopically Barrett's dysplasia mucosal adenocarcinoma. So, um, forward here. So first of all, I want to talk about the indication of endoscopic treatment. Um, so there's a very um, low, uh, small range where we can treat the patient endoscopically, and it is the, it's dysplasia, low-grade or high-grade dysplasia. It's mucosal Barrett's cancer. But when it starts to invade the submucosal tissue, then the risk for lymph node metastasis, you can see here, is growing up, up to 10% in SM1 cancer or even higher. And when it's invading deeper planes or deeper, uh, deeper uh, planes of the submucosal tissue, then it is, has a very, very high risk of lymph node metastasis. And then the patient is not curable by endoscopic treatment. But not only the infiltration depth is a risk factor for lymph node metastasis, there are other risk factors like lymph vessel infiltration, blood vessel infiltration, poorly differentiated carcinoma, high tumor cell dissociation grade, and the tumor size that are independent risk factors for lymph node metastasis that has to be, have to be considered. So let's start with low-grade dysplasia. Should we treat this and, um, and how? It has been shown that low-grade dysplasia is a risk factor for the development of high-grade dysplasia and adenocarcinoma, as you can see from this New England Journal paper, where patients uh, with Barrett's without low-grade dysplasia with normal Barrett's esophagus were followed, and those who had low-grade dysplasia, and those had a significantly higher risk for progression. And a very nice study came from the Amsterdam group where they had a look at 147 patients with low-grade di uh, dysplasia that was diagnosed in six non-university hospitals in the Netherlands. And those um, histology slides were reviewed by two central expert pathologists. And um, what was very striking was that only 15 percent, um, in only 15 percent of those patients, there was a consensus for the diagnosis of low-grade dysplasia. So uh, the other 85 percent were, uh, were no dysplastic Barrett's. And then they, they followed all those patients up and they saw that those patients who had real low-grade dysplasia developed, had a high risk developing adenocarcinoma or, or high-grade dysplasia, and those who had no dysplasia, no consensus on, uh, on low-grade dysplasia, had a very, very low risk to develop um, high-grade dysplasia or cancer. So um, this study nicely shows that the pathologist is, has, has a very important role in the diagnosis and low-grade dysplasia is over, uh, very often overdiagnosed and overdiagnosis. So there was a prospective randomized trial published last year, um, a European multicenter study, where those patients with confirmed low-grade dysplasia were randomized in a ra uh, radiofrequency ablation arm, RFA arm, and in a follow-up arm, where patients were only uh, put on PPI and then followed up. And they, uh, in this study, they showed that the complete remission of low-grade dysplasia with radiofrequency ablation uh, was 98%. With PPI, it was um, 37%. This is a very high rate, but I think there's also a very um, uh, sampling error uh, in this group. And the most important um, uh, finding was that the progression rate to high-grade dysplasia and mucosal adenocarcinoma was 1.5% in the treatment arm and 25% in the follow-up arm after um, two years. So this study shows you that uh, when there is a real low-grade dysplasia and you, uh, then when you treat the patient with RFA, the progression rate goes, um, very, uh, goes down to 1.5% compared to just follow-up the patient. And this um, Kaplan-Meier plot shows you the results. So let's come to high-grade dysplasia and mucosal Barrett's cancer. There 
is unfortunately no prospective randomized trial comparing surgery with endoscopic treatment. Surgery was for many years the treatment of choice, but there are retrospective series. There's one from the Mayo group here where esophagectomy was compared with endoscopic resection um, in the Mayo Clinic, and they uh, found that mortality was significantly higher in the surgery group, of course, morbidity was higher, and the hospital stay was also higher in the, in the surgery group, um, and the long-term outcome was similar in both groups. The problem was that in, that in that study, those patients who were unfit for surgery were treated endoscopically, and therefore we performed a um, match pairs cohort analysis um, with the University of Cologne, a very big center for esophageal surgery in Germany, where we compared patients who were treated uh, for, with mucosa Barrett's cancer um, surgically, uh, were matched, uh, and then uh, 70, um, 76 patients uh, from our endoscopically treated patient, uh, cohort were matched to those patients that had the same age, gender, infiltration depth, differentiation grade, and Charleston comorbidity index. And we were able to find that surgery um, was, had a, a slightly higher mortality rate, but only one patient died. This was not significant. The morbidity rate was significantly higher um, with 32% compared to 0% in, in the endoscopy group, and, but the recurrence rate was higher in the endoscopy group. But it is, it's very important to say that all patients who had a recurrence in the endoscopy group were retreated endoscopically. This is a series from our group with 349 patients with high-grade dysplasia and um, mucosa Barrett's cancer that were treated in, um, with um, EMR, photodynamic therapy, and combination of those two. And the complete response rate was 96.6%. And the problem was that during follow-up, we found a quite high rate of metachronous neoplasia. So within the remaining Barrett segment, there were other uh, recurrences uh, at a different site. And all, most of them were, could be retreated endoscopically because they were in a follow-up program. But, um, and the long-term complete response rate was almost 95% after five years, but still um, the high ra rate of metachronous neoplasia uh, was a little bit disappointing in this finding. But in long term, um, there was no significant difference between the um, normal German population and the patients treated here regarding survival after five years. So this is a, a very large series published last year from our group where we treated 1,000 patients with intramucosal Barrett's adenocarcinoma endoscopically. We performed 2,687 endoscopic resections in those patients. Complete remission rate was 96.3%. Uh, the recurrence rate, again, was, uh, was lower than in the previous study, but um, still with 14%, quite, uh, um, still not, not uh, low enough. Um, but again, retreatment was possible in most of those patients, and therefore uh, the long-term complete remission rate was 94% after five years. And um, I think this is a very, um, th those are very good results regarding patients with early muco intramucosal adenocarcinoma treated endoscopically. So what, what can we do about the quite high recurrence rate um, after endos successful endoscopic removal of the high-grade dysplasia or cancer. So we found in, uh, in a retrospective analysis that those patients who had an ablation um, of the remaining Barrett's esophagus, um, where usually the recurrences occur, um, had a significantly lower risk for, um, for recurrences than those who had no ablation. And therefore, we performed a prospective randomized trial um, where we uh, randomized 56 patients um, in a PPI and ablation arm with argon plasma coagulation compared to PPI and follow-up arm. And we were able to show that after two years after that, we had to stop the study. We wanted to include more than 100 patients, but we had to stop because there was a significant, such a significant difference that those patients who had only PPI and follow-up um, had a very high rate of metachronous neoplasia and recurrences compared to those who had an ablation of the remaining Barrett's esophagus. And this shows you that you have to uh, always have to treat the patient in a two-concept strategy. First of all, treatment of the 
a focal neoplasia, and after that, ablation of the remaining Barrett's esophagus. So how should we treat the remaining Barrett's esophagus? There are a few concepts out there. One, of, uh, one is the thermal ablation technique with uh, either argon plasma coagulation, as I just showed you, or with um, radio frequency ablation. Another um, concept is to resect the, the whole Barrett's esophagus. Um, the results of this multi -center, European multicenter study were, were, were quite, quite good, but the problem was the high rate of stenosis when you resect the whole circumference with the uh, Barrett's esophagus. And that's why uh, another concept um, should be uh, favored. This is the endoscopic resection combined with radio frequency ablation uh, compared to the radical resection arm I just showed you in this prospective randomized trial. Um, they, the, uh, the Amsterdam group was able to show that the stricture rate was significantly higher in the complete radical resection arm compared to the endoscopic resection com um, combined with radio frequency ablation arms. So this should be the treatment of choice. And this strategy was followed in a very large study from um, several European um, endoscopy centers where 132 patients uh, with high grade dysplasia and early mucosal Barrett's cancer were included they were treated with endoscopic resection followed by radio frequency ablation and complete remission was, um, was found in 98% of patients and complete remission of Barrett's esophagus in 93% of patients. Three recurrences occurred but all of them were um, retreated successfully by endoscopic treatment. So when the complete Barrett's is eradicated, um, how durable is the effect? Does, do we have a recurrence of um, neoplasia after complete um, ablation of the Barrett's or do we have a recurrence of Barrett's esophagus? And there are two studies out, a few studies out showing that the, there, are, there is a small proportion of patients who have a recurrence of Barrett's esophagus or even of dysplasia, but um, it is about 85% um, remain without any recurrences over the years. Um, this is a, also a U.S. multicenter trial showing that um, the success rate of ablation is not as high as shown in the first previous studies. And this is a, uh, this is a study from three major U.S. centers, Mayo Clinic and um, others, other, other important uh, endoscopy centers, and they were able to show that the, they have a quite high recurrence rate in this series. So uh, in daily practice, it's not as good as it has been shown in the, pre in the first studies. So what about submucosal barrier cancer? I, in the beginning of my talk, I told you that when the, pa uh, the, the cancer invades the submucosal tissue, the lymph node risk is, is rising. So what about patients with submucosal barrier cancer? Can we treat them endoscopically? And there's one study um, published several years ago from our group where we had a few patients, 21 patients with uh, cancer invading the first third of the submucosal layer and low risk features. So they had no uh, poor differentiation grade. They had no lymph vessel infiltration and no venous infiltration. And they, those patients were treated endoscopically and um, the most important um, finding was that after five years, um, the, they had no lymph node metastasis. So the 60, uh, the, uh, they had a five-year survival rate of 66%, but there was no tumor-related death, and there were no lymph node metastasis found, and, with, uh, uh, and we had a very close follow-up with EUS and uh, with CT scans. And this uh, study was then um, um, published two years ago in, in the Clinical Journal of Gastroenterology and Hepatology uh, with 67 patients, and um, we had only one patient who developed a lymph um, node metastasis. So this, um, this, those small numbers sh um, suggest that patients with an incipient infiltration of the submucosal layer can be treated endoscopically um, when they are, uh, for example, unfit for surgery. So the final point should, um, should uh, be um, the question, should we perform endoscopic submucosal dissection or should we perform normal endoscopic mucosal resection of the Barrett's 
um, neoplasia. So ESD, uh, the concept of ESD is that we can um, resect a larger area of dysplasia or, or cancer with, um, without uh, so R0, R0, so like the surgeons want to do it. Uh, in contrast, when we would have a larger area of dysplasia and resect it with EMR, we have several pieces and there's a piecemeal resection and the pathologist can, can't tell you that it's resected R0. So concept, uh, from, uh, a concept ESD would be the preferred method, but the, the goal should always be in Barrett's, uh, Barrett's neoplasia, the R0 resection. And there are small publications out from the Western uh, from Western centers that uh, where ESD was performed in patients with high grade dysplasia and early Barrett's cancer was a ve not very large uh, neoplastic lesions, only 20 millimeters in diameter. Um, but the striking results were that only um, less than 40% of patients um, where ESD was performed had an R0 resection. So the problem in Barrett's esophagus is that those neoplastic um, areas are very hard to, um, to delineate, and therefore, for ESD, you all, always have to be able to delineate normal tissue from the dysplastic tissue, and that's not, uh, not possible in most of the cases in Barrett's esophagus, and therefore, ESD is not uh, the treatment of choice right now. And there's one prospective randomized comparison between ESD and EMR, with a cap technique, so piecemeal endoscopic resection and the complete remission rate of neoplasia and complete remission rate of intestinal neoplasia was very similar in both groups, so there's no significant difference. And there's one series out from a German center uh, where we had, from another German center on ESD uh, in early Barrett's cancer, and they had the same very disappointing results regarding our zero resection rate, so no dysplasia at the lateral margin of only 40%. So I would like to come to my conclusions. First of all, low-grade dysplasia, it's very important to obtain a second opinion by an expert pathologist. And after that, when the low-grade dysplasia is confirmed um, and you don't have a visible lesion, then radiofrequency ablation is an option. Or uh, you can also um, closely survey the patient and, and wait until you find a progression on, uh, to high-grade dysplasia, but um, I would suggest radiofrequency ablation is a good choice. High-grade dysplasia in mucosa barrier cancer is very important that you follow the two-step step concept, endoscopic resection of all visible lesions and after that ablation of the remaining Barrett's esophagus and the preferred ablation technique should be radiofrequency ablation. Submucosa Barrett's cancer can be treated um, in selected patients when uh, they don't have any high risk features and when the cancer is invading only the upper third of the, um, of the submucosal tissue. But uh, those patients should be treated in expert centers with a very experienced pathologist and very experienced endoscopist. Lifelong follow-up seems to be necessary, even after complete uh, eradication of, of dysplasia and cancer, and uh, since late recurrences can occur, and there's no ger general recommendation for ESD in early Barrett's neoplasia right now. Thank you very much.